Am I supposed to use this thing or I can just oh okay. Because I just here and it would have been easier. Hi everybody. How are we doing? Um so all the people that came before they are very serious people. Um so can I sit down? Okay. All right. Um Toby has done half of the work, right? As you can see, you guys have spoken about goal setting. Um, so I would continue from where he stopped and brush over a couple of things that he has mentioned. Um, but first, I'm sure you are wondering who is this guy? Abby? Is anybody wondering? Me too, I'm wondering. You know, like. All right. Um, my name is Nifemi. Nifemi uh, Lubuidi. I. Ah, okay. It's plenty. So I currently work as the head of product growth and partnerships at Credit Direct. It's a financial technology company. And what else? Okay. They said that I'm a product leader. I'm a mentor. I'm a what was there again? FinTech expert, startup advisor. The long and short of everything there is that I've worked in plenty of places doing fintech stuff and doing products as well. Um, so far, how have we been doing, Sha? Have we enjoyed all the sessions? You people have done the communication session, have you? Okay, not yet. Because the way people are answering me, I'm like, I want more fire. All right. Before we continue, can we shake our body a bit? Is that okay? All right. So everybody, can we stand up? Stand up for the champion. Hello. Do you want to come and join me? Okay. What are we going to spell now? Do we know the coconuts? This thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, give me a C. Uh, that's our teacher. Yeah, so we're going to spell coconut. Give me a C. Give me an O. Another C. Don't jam somebody. <laughs> give space, give space. O. N. Small letter N is fine. <laughs> Just. Give me a U and give me a T. That's what? All right, let's spell it again. Give me a C. On your own side. For me, it's O, C, O, N. U T. All right, all right. That's free stretching you know, for those that did not get to go to the gym. Um, all right. Oh, does anybody want to spell another word or we are good? <laughs> you don't like spelling bees. Okay. Um Over the next few minutes, and I'm hoping to give room for a lot of questions, um, because I oftentimes think that while all of this is fancy and it looks nice, and you probably write down things that you probably never go back to in this life again, the interactions from asking questions and getting actual answers oftentimes leave a more lasting impression. That's my thought. Um, so I would breeze past the smart goals part. Toby has already, you know, mentioned that. But I'll then also share with you guys some of the things that I think would help with overcoming challenges. Because sometimes, too, these things sound very, eh, it should be specific, it should be measurable. It sounds all fun and games until there's a real life you know, example, 
And it would be nice to also understand some of the problems that you typically come across and maybe steps that would help you to solve those problems so that the practicality of putting it to use is a lot easier. Are we together? And then for things like leadership and problem solving, we don't even have enough time to start to have the conversations. So what I've tried to do here is on the leadership side, I will just touch on a couple of core topics that I think, or should I, I won't even call them topic, but core things that should be at the back of your mind where leadership is concerned. I'll also talk about problem solving. And the last part around integrating these three things together as professionals or as individuals. Let's just say that's the time we are now share story. Right, my plan is to share a personal story with you guys. Um, okay. Does that sound like a plan? Eh? If it doesn't work, what will happen? I should change my plan. All right. Um, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. How do I do this? Okay, I want to be able to see what you've seen, right? So I start by saying a person without a goal is like a marksman with a gun but no target. They may fire, but they won't hit anything meaningful. How many of us watch Olympics? Or at least saw pictures or videos from the Olympics? Hi. You do not see nothing. Are you serious? Ha. So what I'm about to do now, you may not be able to relate. How many of us have seen this recent meme? Meme. Ha. It's only a uh, Maverick City you've watched or what? I don't understand. Let me do it well. Yeah. Ha. Wow. You put need to be current with the times. You've seen it. I mean, what was it about? Um, so it was about the Turkish guy in the Olympics that um, came to, that won the silver medal. Um, so basically, everybody was making use of gadgets, but he just came with his glasses alone when he won silver. Yeah. Uh, where from? How was your night? I was trying to say that it was a guy that looks like a nerd, that had that he was just very cool, and then next thing he was another guy. I remember it now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I use that example because again, I'm talking about marksmen, and what it was right, or so the parallel to draw from that was, they came to the Olympics to shoot, right? Shooting is one of the sports. You know, Abby? Or, are you, or you just found out now? Okay. Right, shooting is one of the sports. And for a lot of the guys, you know, they came with gadgets, some stuff to tape their hands so that their hands don't wander about. Some have the weirdest looking goggles so that it's tunnel vision. Nothing can confuse, you know. And this guy just comes normal, just wears glasses, put his hand in his pocket, and he was just, bah, like others were, ah, nothing. And the guy was hitting the target a lot of times. Uh, why I'm using that as an example is, oftentimes, people set goals, or people say they're setting goals, but there's actually no target. There's no, I was going to say somebody can give me a random goal. What is one of the goals that you have, for instance? Uh, that you have in life. But again, we're all guilty of it, too, so there's no right or wrong answer. Me too, if I tell you, ah, by the time I'm 40, I want to be living in Banana Island. You say, go. Whether I'll score the goal or not is a different question. <laughs>
Okay. All right. So I'm taking it that you make stuff that people consume. He run you. The normal one or the baba? Everybody is there. Corn, so gum. Interesting. Okay. So again, that might be an example of something somewhat generic, right? Because, maybe because I'm not in our space, I can't work with these specifics. And I said I was going to breeze over smart, but I think we're already talking about smart. Um, did you guys have examples when you had the previous session? Or it was just the template? Oh, okay. The reason why I'm dwelling on that or why I'm asking about that now is because while it sounds like a very lofty goal, the question is what is, and for context like this, she may not necessarily need to share with us the full, so she might have it in her head, she might have it written down. But for you, oftentimes, when you're doing this in your own space, it's important that you're not deceiving yourself. You can come outside and sound right and sound correct, but is your inside work that you are doing correct? The expectation is that for her, she has said what the generic goal is. How would she measure that yesterday's taste is the same as today's taste? There has to be a standard into the preparation. That's why you have things like cookbooks. That's why you have you know, measures to say if you are going to be baking a muffin, you need three tablespoons of flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, two teaspoons of brown sugar, they will even specify the color of the sugar, um, a pint of vanilla flavor. I'm just using that as an example for specificity. So usually you're able to say when you have added all these ingredients together in this proportion under this condition, this is the expected outcome. What it means is the day that somebody uses two and a half spoons of flour instead of three, the quality would most likely tilt. Or instead of using one pint of vanilla flavor, you use two. The vanilla will now be heavier than what your standard is. So there's some element of quality control that should go into it. And then is it achievable? Of course, if you've mentioned everything that goes into it and how it should go to it to a large extent, the achievability question is answered. Relevant. Using her example, it is very relevant in a light line of work. Quality control is very important. And time bound. So telling yourself this is exactly when I would do this or when I intend to do this. Again, what I tried to do here was give you guys examples of what is smart and what is not smart. In my line of work, where we do mobile apps and all those things, somebody can just come, ah, I want to increase the download by 500% in three days. Like, oh God, how do you want to do it? If you could do it, why were you waiting till today to tell us you do it? Just do it and let's see the impact, right? Oh, I want to improve my leadership skills. How? What area of your leadership skills? First of all, have you even audited yourself to see what are the skills required? Which ones do you have? Which ones are you deficient in? Which ones do you need to work on yourself You know, to get? And I will not overly dwell on this side because they've given you good templates and you have applied the template. Is that fine? Okay. So moving on. If the plan does not work, change the plan but never the goal. And what does this mean? It's okay that you've planned to achieve it a certain way, but if it doesn't work, what it means is whatever you are doing is not the right mix. Again, coming back to our example, assume that there is a standard that she was expecting to come out for our Ogi. Now it's our Ogi, right? If she has done all the mixes the way she wants to do it, in the measure she wants to do it, if for whatever reason it comes out and it doesn't taste the way it should taste, the taste is the goal in this 
context, right? Whether it's a picture in her head, whether it's a question of flavor or whatever. Now, if she has mixed everything up and it comes out and the taste is not what is expected, what it means is your plan to achieve the goal has not worked. So while you are, it's okay for you to change the plan, oftentimes what we are guilty of is we change the goal. Because changing the goal now means, mm, and it's not bad, though. we said it like that. And that's the beginning of compromise. And as professionals, even in your careers, oftentimes there is the picture that you have in your mind. There is a picture of the type of worker, the type of business owner that you want to be. And sometimes life just hands you a different package entirely. So the question is, do you settle for the package that life has delivered to you? Or you come and say what you got is not what you ordered, and you still keep pushing for what you actually ordered. Does that make sense? But wait, I have a question, a genuine question, and I'm hoping somebody will answer me. If it did not make sense, who would have said it did not make sense? <laughs> eh? No, because you've now said yes, but I, it now got me thinking that if it did not make sense, would any of you have said, no, it's like you're saying rubbish? Your expression to show is you will be squinting your face, Abby. But she has maintained a straight face half of the time, so I cannot use the expression to judge. All right. That was on a lighter note, sir. All right. So let's get into the more interesting stuff. What are some of the challenges that you naturally find or come across when you're trying to set goals? Because again, it's all nice and fun to say, I want to become, ah, sorry, I should have done introduction. Sorry, lady in mustard, let's just do round round. Give me your first names quickly. I know, but okay. Ella. Yeah, Lely. Messi. Grace, Ella. Delight, like I'm delighted to see you. <laughs> awesome. Mercy, Grace, Ella, Delight. Huh? Dorcas. Say it out loud. <laughs> I know Grace too. Ah, okay. ah, Ella, you're the only one that is no English name here. Mercy, Grace, Delight, Ella, Dorcas. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's acronym. M G E. D, D, O. Hmm, Magd. I'll be Madeg. I'll come back to it. All right. So, yeah, Mercy. Is there any of these challenges that you can relate with? Which one is the most? All of them. Oh, okay. Focus and tracking progress. Oh, okay. Grace? The thief of time. Okay. Ella? Sorry? Procrastination. No, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, it's you, it's your turn now. <laughs> um, um, not tracking progress and procrastination, maybe. Okay, so everybody is a procrastinator. Doc has shocked me. No, <laughs> I'm not going to shock you. Oh, okay, yes, true. <laughs> so mine is procrastination. Oh, goodness. <laughs> And not tracking progress. No, 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 I'm tracking progress. You are tracking, oh, come on. Oh, and then lack of focus. 
Ha. Now nah, I'm afraid of tasting your gyo. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure there's focus inside? Ah, <laughs> uh -uh, okay, customer dada. Fantabulous. Uh, how about Tara? Um, procrastination, lack of commitment. Lack of commitment. It was sounding like relationship problem, not good setting problem, but okay. <laughs> All right. Again, why I decided to do this is uh, so that it doesn't also look strange. And everybody saying it out loud, it also helps you understand that. Uh, in the words of the famous singer of blessed memory, you are not alone. Uh -huh. So yeah, procrastination is a valid challenge that people often face. Ah, OK, we've left here today. Once I get home, I'm going to set those goals, smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable. We will finish the rest. Uh -huh. I said I'm going to set my smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable. Correct. So who is going to set smart goals when they get to or no next weekend? Because by the time you get to you'll be tired, you need to relax, there's prayer meeting in the evening. Then tomorrow you have to be in church early. After service again, you still have one or two meetings. So next weekend we'll set our smart goals. Who is committing to setting their smart goals next weekend? Only one person. Two. Eh? Ah, you are the only one that passed this test. You see them procrastinators. The reason they will set it next week. You are raising up your hand. Ah, this is Agba procrastinator. <laughs> this week is gone. Wow, wow. But again, the idea behind this was to hold to help you see how it creeps in with subtlety. Because right here and now, Somebody has spent the last one hour saying your goals have to be smart. I just showed you uh, this thing. I say smart, not smart. But you still want to not be smart. <laughs> okay. I'm praying for the blood of Jesus so that I will not be throwing jabs like that anymore. But yes, there's a reason why it's called smart goals, so that we can make smart choices and start to implement them like immediately. So again, procrastination is really huge. And oftentimes, as human beings, you would find that there is hardly anything you're doing at a certain point in time that you can't make a valid, well, it may not be valid, but at least you can't make the attempt of a valid argument to yourself as to what else you should have been doing at that time. Do you understand what I'm saying? For instance, as I'm here now, I can tell you five different things I could have been doing at this time that would have made sure that I was not here. I don't know about you. So what it meant is this is happening because I've chosen not to is it procrastinate or not. And in reality, when you have goals to set, the last thing that should be on your mind is you set it later. You have phones, you have writing pads. Quickly start to scribble them down, right? Don't wait to later that may not come. The fear of failure is also very valid because, again, when you have been pushed, you have been challenged. For instance, I put an example here. I think I should read it out. Maybe somebody might copy it. That I will connect with 12 new industry professionals. That's the measurable part. By attending two networking events per month, following up via LinkedIn over the next 12 months to build a network that supports my career growth. Again, this example was deliberate because when the earlier speaker I was speaking, she has spent time telling people how you should use LinkedIn and whatnot. 
Toby came, he has also told you about productivity, how you measure your productivity, goal setting, and whatnot. And in real life, right, a good way to now say, ah, I want to do X, Y, Z, is putting some of these things into practice. So you were the one that asked the question around, there was one question you asked about your LinkedIn and zeroing in on something specific. Was that you? Huh? A niche. Uh, so for instance, this might be a valid example for somebody like you to say, in this niche, what is that your niche? Communication. Oh, yeah, real estate communications or not communications, don't mind me. Right, for you, it could be you plan to connect with 12 new communication professionals by attending two communication type networking events per month and then following up via LinkedIn over the next 12 months to build a network that supports that goal. And in real life, right, you can plan towards these things to say, how do I meet 12? 12 means if I'm doing two events per month for 12 months, it means at least for every two events, I must connect with one person, more than enough. Or maybe even attempts to connect to five people per event. If you do five per event, that's 10 per month. Out of 10, at least one will answer you and you have added that person to your network. If you do that every month, so in real life, what it will mean is, first off, who are some of the professionals in your industry? You list them out or you use LinkedIn to filter them out. What are the events that, uh, that you typically find these people at? You list out those events. And then which ones are you able to attend? Is it free? Is it paid? Can I afford to pay for it if I have to pay? When you calendarize it in that manner and whatnot, you know that ah, the next event is September. Uh, when is the next weekend? It's, okay, August 21st. You've already planned yourself. You know you are going to be there. Come rain, come high water. And you make deliberate actions towards. And I'm sure when Dami is talking to you guys about communications, you also understand how you should position yourself when you're approaching these people for the first time. Like, I've not met you before. You want to connect with me. Oftentimes, you know, you try to find common ground and just throw it in. Oh, good day, ma. Ah, by the way, I follow you on LinkedIn. That article you wrote about seven effective ways to communicate um, in corporate communications, I really found, even if she did not know you before, you have already entered. Because it's almost like, a validation when somebody has done something you've taken time to see what they've done and it's not just on surface level you're you know bringing up conversations from it so back here right so while i well, why i went to do the missionary journey back to that slide was one of the things that people are afraid of the most is the fear of failure or even sometimes rejection so imagine she has told herself she wants to be meeting new people. That's her new goal in life, meeting new people, meeting new people. New people. And she just walks up to the first person, and the first person just like, eh -eh, as I was saying, like as if you are not there. I can promise you that that event, she's not meeting anybody again, or at least for a lot of people, right? It takes a certain level of resolve for you to dust it off, especially when it's the first person. If you have done like three, four, and it's the fifth one that is doing anyhow, you'll be like, I beg your own, it's too much. You just cancel the person from your potential mental list, right? But if it's the first one, you'll just be like, ah, oh, this is as aspire to Magoya people that told us that we should go and be connecting with people. They will not tell us this part now, right? Lack of focus, like a lot of us have pointed out, Focus is not the easiest thing to do because you could be in another setting like this and the gospel that is being preached in that setting is 
how you should stretch yourself, how you should multitask, how you should be able to do plenty of things at the same time. Technically, that's the opposite of focus, right? However, you can also have multi-pronged focus. Where, and I think I like what Toby shared with you guys with the um, timesheet thing. For instance, there was a time when I was working and my job cut across two different time zones. So I was working for the Nigeria office and the India office. India office is about four and a half, five hours ahead of our time. So what it meant was that if they are doing a meeting at 9 a.m. on their side, that meeting is like 4.30 a.m. on our side. It's not me that they will kill. So I try to make sure that there are meetings that involve me does not start till like maybe 11 their time, which also means that by 6.30, I'm ready to join meeting. But there are days I cannot lie. That that's 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> it's me that we off the alarm, right? What I then started to do differently was I became very deliberate about boxing every 15, 30 minutes portion of my calendar so that while I was not spending the full eight hours with these guys, I'd planned my time to say from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. and p.m. Nigerian time. I'm working for India. From 12 p.m. to mama calls. Mama can call at 12 a.m. sometimes. I'm working for Nigeria. But you see inside that five hours that I've given those ones, every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, when it's not a meeting, from as little as I want to spend time to review this report, 15 minutes is in my calendar. I want to spend 30 minutes to have a meeting with my downlines. It's in my calendar. Breakfast, 30 minutes to grab coffee so that I will not die before my time. is in my calendar. That way, I became accountable. Google Calendar also tried to hold me accountable because when it's almost time to remind me that I have to do this. Then the added extra on it is you can, and I think Toby had mentioned when he was speaking, some of the tools, the asanas of this world or the trellos and whatnot, or even Google tasks or Microsoft tasks rather, right? You can make these things a task on those tools so that beyond the reminders, it's also helping you to tick the box. One of the things that you would find to be interesting about us human beings is we love to play games. Like, we just love the idea of competition. We don't like to lose. Anybody here likes to lose. So imagine that you have a checklist today, 10 items. You only check four. Tomorrow, you check three. Next tomorrow, you check five. By Thursday, it will be biting you. Either you reduce it or you tell yourself that you must complete it. So to a large extent, infusing some element of mental gamification might also help you to you know, have that um, tunnel vision type level of focus. Unrealistic expectations. When we are setting our goals, we should be coming down. I think that's the easiest way to explain it. Um, not tracking progress. I think I've also given you examples with this whole tra um, task thing, where you make sure that for everything you're doing, you know, for some of these goals, they might seem big, so you can also break them down into chunks. So that you say that, okay, on Monday, I will do X, Y, Z. On Tuesday, I will do X, Y, Z. On Wednesday, I'll do X, Y, Z. By Friday, everything I've done from Monday to Friday should sum up to the completion of this 
major task. And then, of course, lack of commitment. That one is, is God that can help you, let me just tell you. <laughs> because it's very easy to just lose commitment. Sometimes I want to sleep. I don't want to wake up in the morning. I just want to be sleeping. Do I have a witness? There are times when you just open your eyes, the alarm is sounding, like, even though, but you snooze. But guess what? If you snooze, you what? Uh, again, it's not the easiest thing. It's not the... <laughs> Go set. <laughs> again, it's not the easiest thing to do. But oftentimes, I think at the base of commitment is you having some level of resolve. And when the overarching goal stays top of mind, it sort of serves as motivation. And sometimes, some of these things, if you flip them, they could also be a source of motivation, right? For instance, personally, one of my biggest sources of motivation is that I don't like failure. So if I wake up in the morning and I want to sleep like this, I'm just like, ha, never, never, never. Today we go again. Today we go again. Right? And I think having that level of mental, you know, I was almost going to say mental commitment, mental resolve helps to reaffirm why you're doing what you do, why you're waking up in the morning. to Because... Again, and sometimes the easiest reminder, if it is work-related, is hunger. Right? If hunger, why are you small? And hunger is in different grades. You have a witness. There's the hunger of nothing at all. There's the hunger of what you want, you can't get. There's shades and sizes of hunger. But at different points in time, hunger will help you to reset. Sometimes it could also even just be a state of, you know, you've looked at yourself, you've looked at where you wanted to be, and you see that you are not there, and that's the motivation. So at every point in time, there should be some form of anchor that helps you to reaffirm your commitment. And yes, on the days when it doesn't look so great, those anchors are the reminders that help you to flip your script. Okay? All right. So, to overcome this, I think you guys touched on some of these things earlier. Set your goals, be accountable, I mentioned breaking it down, and also prioritizing, right? Knowing that, okay, while I've broken this down, this one comes first, this one comes next, so that you're not doing the one that I should be doing last first, and it sort of um, convolutes the entire thing for you. All right. So like I said about leadership, leadership, people go to full-time school for leadership. So we cannot even begin to, what's the word now, delve into the entire concept. But what I've tried to do is share some very important um, aspects or elements of leadership. Sorry, I'm blocking your view. Mm -hmm. All right. Emotional intelligence. I know we hear this thing a lot, but can somebody tell me what they think about emotional intelligence? Because we are intelligent, yes, but which one is the emotional inside? Or does anybody have, do we even agree with the school of thoughts that there is such a thing? Oh, we all agree. So there are people that you meet in this life, you look at this person and like, this person, he has sense, so, but emotionally, it doesn't have sense. Eh? You've met people like that. How do you deal with them? Someone like that, but not in person, like online. Yeah, it's the same so thing. the person had made a comment on someone's post and had said the comment like uh, um, something in the line of for someone that is going to die soon, 
this person was making a comment for someone who is a sickle cell warrior. So those kind of comments could trigger. Um, <laughs> but how I dealt with the person was I told the person that this kind of comment is not the right comment to make. I mean, for someone like that, even to anybody, you can't just tell somebody that the person is going to die soon or drop down dead and even had the, the casket emoji to it. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, and I'm playing devil's advocate here. What's the difference between that and dark humor? That your laughter is it giving emotional intelligence? Like you're laughing at me. So who are you laughing at? My situation. I think the difference with that is okay. The next response the person will give to whatever you have said. So the person could just make a comment that oh, it was just dark humor. You don't understand or something like that. But the response this person said was. I don't see anything wrong in what I said. Okay. I think we can agree that that person does not have sense emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to say people don't have sense. I believe that people have sense in different areas in their own unique way. I have, I'm yet to see anybody that is completely senseless, in my opinion. I can be wrong. But everybody has sense. Because to not have sense requires some. It requires sense to not have sense. Like you've lost it and you had it at some point. But yeah, a leader manages and understands others' emotions to build strong relationships and navigate complex interpersonal dynamics. You see that English that is in one sentence, sentence in every sentence. The long and short is oftentimes, right, when especially when you find yourself in leadership. I think one of the best leadership books that anybody can read in this life is 360 Degree Leadership by John Maxwell. If you are able to lay your hands on it, feel free. And why I quickly chip that in is there is the common misconception or, yeah, let's leave it as common misconception that you have to be in charge or at the top to be a leader. But what he helps to preach is you can be a leader from any part of the spectrum. You don't have to have the leader title before you start to lead, right? And when you look at it, do you actually need to be a leader to have emotional intelligence? But guess what? When you're in positions where you're leading, you're naturally required to apply emotional intelligence. Because, for instance, there's six of you, even though five of you have English names, and I cannot say what the diversification is. The point is, these are six different individuals with six different mindsets. I'm sure if we ask you people to explain a couple of very neutral concepts will probably get six different definitions or six different versions of how you understand it. Should we try it? Or you agree? I said if we did it, you can't, you just like communication, expression. Oh yeah, let's use communication, define communication. Ah, wait now. Um, communication is being able to convey um, an information or message or anything to someone. It could be visual, it could be written. To be able to explain it to a five-year-old, a five-year-old understand, and a 90-year-old also understand. So basically saying, being able to just communicate to someone, being able to talk, and then people Communication is just being able, being able to, to communicate talk, with someone. know how to talk, to and then talk. convey a message, and then it is is able to... And then you're, you're able to... Um, okay, I'm able to convey a message to you and then you can understand and comprehend what I'm saying and then you can respond to what I'm saying because you understand what I'm saying. So, yes. You know you have given like three definitions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Grace, let's hear your own. Everything the first speaker said. <laughs> Aside 
that's what she has said. It's the way you pass a message to someone and receive a response. That's just good. Cool okay. Ah, is everybody just be thinking of your own? No? <laughs> Communication is a means of passing information to somebody, to an individual, right? And then getting response. It's more like what she said. Yeah, so if I'm passing to the whole, sorry, when the president is passing to the whole country, it's not communication. <laughs> it's com you said individual now. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can always, if the president is passing an information, I mean, you can be watching with your phone. I mean, it's an individual watching it, or okay. a group of people, let's say. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Communication for me is basically um, being articulate with your words that um, the person on the receiving end understands your intents and the message you're trying to pass across. You said something in the beginning, being articulate with? Your words. Okay. So again, you know, me, I like to just think in a funny way. How many of us watch Mr. Bing growing up? Did he communicate? Did he ever use his words? No. Okay. So again, it's, I, and I, I'm here to see a version of this definition that is incorrect. However, it picks on the different things that, or at least it tells me the different things that you guys would prioritize when communication is a subject. So for instance, I know that with delight, let me just be talking. With mercy, I cannot forget mercy, 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 mercy said no. With mercy, our own is let Asha understand. And she's already waiting to respond, or at least she can respond, whether with actions or inactions. Capish? Let's hear you on. Communication is an act of um, relating a message to someone in a manner in which that person can understand and relate. Per. <laughs> ah, is how she's looking at me. She cannot relate to what I just said. <laughs> I did not communicate. I was only communicating here. <laughs> OK. Uh, Communication is a verbal or non-verbal way on which you um, transmit information to a person or a group of people and then they understand and can respond. Let's just say you have summarized everybody's <laughs> <laughs> The peck of being the last person. <laughs> Me or my own definition, I agree with the last speaker. Again, why? Oh, shit. Communication, baby. <laughs> So why I had us go through this quick exercise is so that we also understand that oftentimes when you find yourself in a position of leadership, this exercise was an example of people see things in different ways. And the place of emotional intelligence is you serving the role of trying to create some level of equilibrium. The reality of working with people or leading different people oftentimes means that this, sorry, grace can be displeased about delight. Oh, sorry, grace is not delighted about something that delight is doing. Are you with me now? Are you with me now? All right. Or uh, delight is not engraced by the actions of mercy. And uh, mercy gave her a laugh. <laughs> okay, I need to stop. Where I was going with this is you would find that sometimes it's as simple as this person is angry about something. When you hear it, knowing this person 
helps you to understand that this person probably did not mean it the way this person is interpreting it. And your role is now to help balance it out. Not that I say, ah, that's how she does. Rather, you are even in a position where you're potentially helping um, Grace to see it from Dorcas's standpoint, or helping Grace to see that this thing that you are complaining about, if we actually look at it, it's not the problem, right? And again, it's probably another thing that sounds very aspire to Maguire, because we are who we are. But that's why it is a skill that you then need to work on, that you then need to train yourself on. And one of the things I would usually tell people as the first basis for your emotional intelligence journey is eliminating your biases, right? The moment you are approaching stuff neutral, not with the preconceived notions or concepts that you have in your mind, okay, it's not heavy, Abby. It should be an easy journey. Effective communication. I will not dwell on this one because the one that comes after I. Ah, you people have not read Bible this year. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. So uh, just consider that line as the John the Baptist of your communication talk. Strategic thinking. This one too is another big word that people like us will come and put on PowerPoint, which thinking is not strategic. Eh? Because they've now put strategy inside now. It's supposed to be a special type of thinking. Well, again, the way they would help you to explain it, and by the time I read it out, you now see that it's not so strategic after all. It's just thinking, but... A leader sees beyond the immediate tasks and considers long-term goals, implications, and how it aligns with broader organizational objectives. Again, if you have become familiar with concepts like SMART goals, you will find out that it's not so hard to think strategically. Because if you know the goal in sight, you've broken down how you are going to achieve the goal the elements of it that is measurable, the time sensitivity around it, the leap between your default thoughts and strategic thoughts is this task will be completed today, but what is the implication on the entire goal if I don't complete it today? You are now starting to think beyond the immediate and seeing the bigger picture. So in words of like project management or maybe even product management as well, you find that you're very deliberate about looking at all the small, small pieces and how they impact the big pieces. For instance, uh, okay, for instance, let's say at work, I've told my or God that I would deliver a brand new shiny mobile app in six months. We've unbundled all the things that will be required. First off, somebody has to write a comprehensive document that explains everything the mobile app will be able to do. That person works with an engineer. The engineer will now craft out what the architecture of the technical system will look like. That person will now take that and go to a designer. The designer will help to design what every single screen on that app would look like. So that one's work. You can even end up designing as many as 100 screens, right? Because your login is one screen. Dashboard is another screen. Again, all of all those things. Now, there is the front-end part of the person that would convert those pictures into the app version. There is the back-end person that would make sure that when I tap login, the screen would change, and it will ask me for something. When I say submit, it will actually submit and send it somewhere, and something will happen. 
that person is doing his work. There is a quality assurance person across board that makes sure that the picture that the designer created is what was translated to the app. So that if I said login is blue, the person doing it does not change it to green. If I say that when I click submit, I'm supposed to get an email that you have submitted your form, that is actually happening. So there is a quality assurance or a test person that just makes sure that everything ties together. Now already I've mentioned like five or six different individuals or stakeholders. Now for each of them, everything they have to do is broken down and they have timelines. The person writing the document says you have five days to write this all-encompassing document. Nothing must be missing, nothing must be broken. The person designing, you have told us that ah, you need to design a hundred screens. At 10 screens per day, it needs, you need 10 days. Again, let's be nice, 10 working days, right? So that your weekend is your own. So I have already, that's already three weeks into my six months, right? The guy that will implement all those 100 screens will now come and say, ah, I need four weeks to implement 100 screens. I assume that I'll be doing 25 screens per week. The guy that is designing the Akiabi, that is implementing the system in the back end that we never see, says, ha, to make this thing solid and everything, me too, I need my own four weeks. The only difference is that these four weeks can start during that guy's four weeks, but at some point, their work will merge, it will overlap. So that's a six weeks on top of the initial three weeks. We are now in what, nine weeks. And how many weeks is in the six months that I promised? 24. So nine plus six, we are already 15 weeks in. Now, the person that wants to test says for him to test very well, he needs two weeks to test every single thing, all the hundred screens, all the shalai that everybody has done. That takes us to 17. Now, in the true sense of it, I can do that plan and say it's a 20 weeks plan. But I've bought extra four weeks by telling them I need six months. What then happens is, as we start from week one, and you see that these things trickle into some of the things that we've spoken about before. From week one, we are tracking progress. Everybody that was supposed to do every item in week one, have they finished? Yes. The moment one person does not finish, there's a spillover. And every spillover naturally has an impact on the final deadline. Especially when, if you don't finish your own, the next person cannot start. And so part of strategic thinking is then you knowing that by week three, based on where everybody is, it might affect the end deadline. So from that period, you're already giving the stakeholders updates. Again, because you've bought an extra four weeks, you are still fine. But the moment spillover has started to enter two weeks, three weeks, you can quickly communicate. And then there are some spillovers that are avoidable. Somebody says, ah, it's in the middle of that your uh, 20 weeks that he wants to go on two weeks leave. Whereas he's the one that has promised four weeks to finish something. Meaning inside his four weeks, he will not do two weeks. When he comes back, he will not do two. The point is, for every one of those actions, you are now thinking about the reaction that the overall project could potentially have out of it. To say that at their trade-offs, you are now looking at things like, for instance, the guy that says he needs two weeks to test, does he have to wait for everybody to finish testing? Or if everybody is doing line item, line item, can he be testing immediately each person is finishing the line item so that the two weeks that you would have spent for him to be the only person working, you can save it if he's working on a weekly basis when the four weeks guys are working. 
again, I've just tried to use that as an example. And you find that if you think about it from that perspective, the more you think that way, the more it starts to look like common sense, not necessarily strategic. And that's why I said, when you practice a lot of these things sometimes, you find out that this whole strategic thinking thing is a myth. You just need to apply yourself to what you are doing. And I think the key word sometimes is try to see beyond the immediate and see the bigger picture. Capish? All right, continuous learning. I think we can't stress that enough. Um, Lemuel also mentioned something like that during our session. You cannot stop learning. Even, I think at some point I took a pause from learning, but I know in the second half of this year, is plenty, plenty of learning. I just finished one program some weeks ago. The day I finished that one, I started another one that is for like four or five months. Again, learning is fun because you oftentimes find, they say experience is the best teacher, but the caveat I oftentimes add to it is it doesn't have to be your own experience. And what, you know, classroom experiences help you with is your learning from other people's experiences. For instance, some of the things that you guys have been taught about LinkedIn here today, I mean, I learned it in real life, like grinding and when she was talking about easy apply, ah, I was like, hey, you need me catch yourself. The number of easy apply I've done in this life, back in the day. And again, how many of you have they called you from easy apply? You to think about it. But it's the truth. At least during my application, ah, easy apply. My CV is already there. Easy apply. I, and LinkedIn is very, they are spoiled. They just, bah, they pick it for you. They, in fact, sometimes they will tell you that the recruiter from the company is looking at your profile. You will be like, ah, they will call me. It doesn't always happen, right? So as much as possible, again, never stop learning, especially about that thing that, you know, you're passionate about. And I was, I said that I was going to speak to this you know, specifically because of you. Sometimes it's okay to do niche, right? And maybe when I wrap it up by giving you a good gist about myself. Um, I decided to go niche in 20, say like 2015-ish, niche-ish. Ah, shoot, somebody needs to stop me. And it has worked out for me, right? It, doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But I think one of the key things that she also mentioned was is sometimes, at least even if you're going to do it, don't do it too early, right? Make sure you have some level of broad knowledge. I work in anything that has to do with financial technology. I've been a product manager for a couple of years. If you tell me to come and be a product manager and the company does ed tech or health tech or anything tech that is not fin inside, I will not apply for your work. Again, that's me because I picked a niche and I've focused on that niche. And sometimes what it helps you to do is, especially if it is an industry that is big enough, people like people that are experts in what they do at certain points. There are times or there are settings where being a generalist is better. For instance, if you are going to be working in a startup startup, they oftentimes prefer generalists. That way they don't have to hire plenty of people. For instance, in my office, in your world, right, the department is brand marketing and comps in one department. So inside that department, there is a copywriter, there is a social media person, there is I'm going somewhere. Inside graphics, there's the graphics designer, there's motion graphics, there's illustrator, there's photographer, there's videographer. Like, everybody will not work in sizable companies. So the question is, at the onset, at least 
skill up on the general basis before you then pick whatever you want to generalize in. Because in your world, you could be the best copywriter. But the higher up you get to, except you just want to stop at being the head copywriter or the lead copywriter, you would require some elements of generalization to fill up certain roles. Again, using the example, the person that is the head of that department now is heading three disciplines, marketing, brand, and comms. But if you have said you are a comms person, the day that they are looking for head of marketing, brand, and comms, at best, they will hire you and you say team lead comms. But most likely, you may not cut across everything. Again, I'm just you know, putting that out there to say, yes, it's OK to focus on a specific niche. But at least before you've done that, it's always good that you have a base knowledge of multiple aspects of that industry before you focus. Empathy, empathy, empathy. Empathy, as the name implies, what does empathy mean? Because you're about to nod your head and say yes. Oh yeah, what do you understand empathy to me? Please help me give out the microphone. What if the shoe did not size you? I'll give her, she has idea. Oh yeah, now let's hear it. Sorry? Considering the other person's feelings. And like, perspectives, like and I wrote, have Oh, yes, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> like, considering the person's feelings, like trying to understand the person's emotion at that time and relating to that person in a way um, that the person does not find, um, I don't know, just being emotionally um okay so let me flip let me flip over. the question a little bit assume we were a group and you are our leader in real life tell me how empathy plays a role okay so if um someone is slacking in the team so you walk up to that person and understand what the person is probably going through. It might not just be that the person is slacking because the person does not want to do the job. It could be the person is going through something that is affecting the job. So you understand the person's emotion and see how you can guide the person. And you could also like assign someone else to help the person come up and all that. OK, so while I like and agree with this example, I feel like it's the most commonly used version but sometimes as a leader right there's the flip side of empathy and that's why i had put in the perspectives caveat because oftentimes when people talk about empathy they stop on the person's feelings or maybe even throwing emotions that like you said putting yourself in the person's shoe but the perspective part is important because sometimes it's Using the example you gave, the person is actually just slacking because the person slacks. And empathy sometimes means that you put yourself in the person's shoe, you see that the person is a slacker, and you give it to the person's heart the way a slacker should be given to. Not necessarily you saying, oh, understanding the person, uh, maybe you should be nice to the person. Sometimes the perspective is when you're in that person's headspace or in that person's shoe, and you're seeing things from that person's perspective, it is even giving you insights into exactly why that person is slacking. Like for instance, you put yourself in the person's One of the people that work or that report to me at work, for instance. I saw that sometimes, sometimes people even ask me what she's doing. So one day I'm like, you know what, going forward, 5 p.m. every day, 
send me a breakdown of everything you've done for the day before you go home. Right? Day one, I get my report. Day two, I get my report. Day three, I get my report. Day four, show you the why mini. Day five, no report. And then I come back in the morning, I'm like, ah. I said every day, I'd not say for the first three days, ah, I'm sorry. Once in, one. in that moment, as we were discussing, I by myself, I set a reminder on both our calendars that 5 p.m. remind her to send her report. Me, I'm getting the reminder. I'm waiting for the report. Sometimes I will not get the report. On Wednesday, I will now get Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday. First off, the empathetic side of me said, maybe she forgot. And that's why I said, let me help her to create the calendar. Because again, that's what I would do. You have a lot going on, it's easy to forget and whatnot. However, we've also gotten to a point, because the last conversation, this one is even fresh conversation, as of last week, I just said, I reminded you of your report. You say you will send it. This is 5.30. You have still not sent today's one. Ah, I'm about to send it. I say, ah, my empathy has finished now. What's the punishment if I don't get this report by 5 p.m. tomorrow, which was yesterday. That's true. When the day comes, Seth. Sorry. Because now I need to think of the punishment. But the point is, sometimes, right, putting yourself in the person's shoes just helps you to understand why the person is the way they are. And the reaction to that does not necessarily mean you have to be nice. Sometimes the reaction is you have to be the opposite of nice because that's what is required. And sometimes you can even be recommending training, like this one, goal setting, productivity tracking, time scheduling and whatnot. Success is a collection of problems solved. Amen? Amen? OK. All right, so I'll just run through this very quickly to one of the things that you will find yourself having to do constantly in life is solving problems, whether as a professional, whether as a leader, whether as a business owner. And one of the common methods that would typically be applied towards problem solving. Is, call it Dabi. I was trying to do Debbie, but Debbie did not Debbie, but Debbie with an A, so Debbie, right? Ah, nobody is wearing Debbie. Mm, Debbie. I should have done Debbie, Abby. Yeah. Mm, yeah. We'll figure something out, yeah. but yeah. Again, the key element is you define ma. The key element, <laughs> the key elements here, defining the problem, very important. Analyzing the problem, also very important. Analyzing would involve, you know, breaking it down into chunks, and then you brainstorm. Brainstorm sounds very aspire to Maguire, but it's also spending time understanding the problem. For instance, in my line of work, the problems we find ourselves solving half of the time is payment-related problems. For instance, what is the easiest way you pay money today? So card, transfer, which one do you prefer? Card. You like card? You like card? Put in 16 digits, wait for OTP. Sometimes OTP will not come. You can call. Sharp, sharp. App or USSD? Transfer. App or USSD? 
Uh, which one is sweet? Oh, okay. So again, right, at different points, we've had problems in that space that needed solving. And part of brainstorming the problem is breaking down the different fragments of that problem. For instance, in the card space, there was a time when, and I like what she mentioned because it's a valid example that we've had to deal with the different moving parts that make up the entire ecosystem. There is a card scheme, first of all, before your bank. So your card can either be a VEV card, a MasterCard, or a Visa card. There are a couple of new ones coming, Africo, American Express, and Co. Now, your bank issues, first of all, MasterCard has given your bank a license. Your bank can now issue a MasterCard and gives it to you. Paystack has become an acquirer of those cards, meaning you can go to Paystack and use the card. How many players do we have now? There's already four. Now, when Paystack collects your card details and they send it to your bank, you get an OTP. That OTP is sent by your bank through an SMS gateway. There is now another party. Different providers provide that service. When you put it back in, it goes back to the bank, they authenticate, everybody is happy. Now imagine that the bank that Paystack is using is not your bank. There's a second bank that is also in that equation. So I've mentioned like six different players. What it also means is there are potentially six failure points because any of those six can be down. And it means that transaction you want to do in 30 seconds, somebody can spoil it for you. A good example of the spoiling, for instance, is in the OTPs via SMS. In recent times, it has even been terrible. The telcos have been having the time of their lives. You do transaction, two weeks later, you just see like seven SMS who just enter once. You think somebody has hacked your... This thing, you now check the data and see that, okay, you are the one that spent it. But guess what? At a point, it was causing transactions to fail or people could not finish those transactions. And it was in that time we said, oh, okay, we have people's phone number, we have people's email. Why are we only sending the OCP to phone numbers? And then emails became the thing. So some will tell you to resend to your email. Some will even send it to the two from the beginning. Right, and it was born out of OTP was the problem, separating all the different players, the roles that they are playing. To now say that, ah, okay, this SMS provision. Today, some people, their solution to that problem is they have three different providers of SMS. So that if I send to this one and it fails, I will try the second one, I can try a third one. Again, I'm trying to give you an example of how an actual problem ended up being solved. And which is why a Messi can come here today and tell you that she doesn't have a problem with using CAD because some problems have been solved. There was a time when, in fact, on the gateway side, OTP will expire in five minutes. So sometimes you'll be getting the OTP after it has expired. You now have to go and start again. But again, testament of the problem that has been solved is her coming to say that cards is our preferred. Even me, I'm shocked, but it's, again, it is what it is. Um, okay, well, when you've picked your solution, after brainstorming and you've picked a solution, you implement it, and after implementing, you evaluate. Uh, sorry. So yeah, at the end of the day, right, the question is how do you incorporate all these things? You've now started to set your goals, you've imbibed elements of leadership and problem solving. In real life, 
how do you integrate all these things together? And I'll share a story that is a personal story. So where I worked in 2015, I just joined, I joined the company in October. I was too young that time and green. Why are you laughing? <laughs> there was not a time that I was young, right? Um, and in December, a lot of transactions happening. In fact, I will never forget, it was December 31st. Systems were down. We worked with all the banks in the country, and we just kept getting emails. Our system was down. Imagine bank teller that wants to balance and go home at 4 o'clock. They can't go home because our systems do not allow them to balance their accounts. So imagine getting emails. Each bank, one bank can have maybe 500 branches. The big banks, the UBA, First Bank, Zenit, the ones that don't have plenty, 300, 150. So imagine every bank sending email to one email address. It was just coming. And in one branch, maybe they have like five tellers, three tellers, two tellers. So from one branch, you can get like three or four emails. We kept getting those emails, which we were supposed to close by five o'clock. But our policy was no email must go unresponded to. So we kept responding to, in fact, at some point, I had created templates. Once I just open, I can open 10. I just paste this template. I just do send. 10 emails will just go out at once. Pra! As that 10 is coming, another 20 has replaced it. By 11 p.m., we still had over 1,000 emails to respond to. And there was maybe like three or four of us left in the office. My boss just says, you know what, let's go home. Again, it's 31st, meaning we are not coming on the 1st. And I think the 1st was now a Friday, so it was going to be plus weekend. I just joined the company then, so I wasn't even up for weekend work. There were people that used to work weekends. I didn't used to do weekend work. But as we were going, I told my boss, I was like, you know what? You people should give me modem to take home with me. That time, internet was not the way it is now. The modems that time, if there's no light, it cannot work. I think it was, was this smile? No, I think it was red in color. Spe not SpectraNet, but the SpectraNet time, all those box that we have at the top. <laughs> so I told them to give me one of those that will take it home with me so that I can walk. And then I go home with the modem. In fact, that's the first time in my life that on the 31st at, at 11 p.m., I was not in church in my entire life. Again, elevation, I plugged in online. Elevation used to do 7 to 10, and we go home. So I just got home. And immediately I got home, I plugged the modem. I started responding to emails. I was up till 5 a.m responding to emails. Again, nobody sent me. And we're already going home. If I didn't do it, we would have come back on Monday. And if it's 3,000, we'll meet it and we'll be responding to it. But I kept responding to those emails. On Monday, I get to the office. And one of the or guys just comes in and says, please, who is that Nifemi guy? I've never met him before. I'm like, sorry, I'm doing. I said, ah, you are the one that was busy sending meals, 5 a.m., 4 a.m. I was like, well done. And he gave me one tom tom. I will not forget. In my mind, I'm like, what do I want to use tom tom to do? Months down the line, after appraisals, when it was time for promotion, the policy in the company was that if you are not confirmed, you can't be promoted. I had not been confirmed. I was not eligible for promotion. But it so turned out that when the management team were meeting to decide those that would be promoted, it was one of the guys that mentioned my name that there's one guy that on the 31st, he was just sending emails that they must promote that guy. 
they say, ah, policy says we can't promote him. Uh, what they ended up doing was I got a letter. My salary was increased. I was not promoted. My salary was increased, and the increment was even more than what the people that were promoting, promoted got. Uh, why did I share that story? The 360 leadership thing I talked about, because that weekend changed how they started to see me, even within my team. My manager, in fact, it was from that weekend, I started doing weekend work. The people that we resumed together, they didn't start doing weekend work until like six, nine months in. But me, by my third month, I was doing weekend work. And weekend work meant they trusted you to an extent because you are not coming to the office, you are just working by yourself. That's, that was when remote work was not yet remote work. But weekend work was like remote work. And why I share that story sometimes is Doing the extra or getting the extra is not oftentimes born out of doing what is expected, but doing what is expedient. And also, it coming from a place of natural occurrence. You are not doing it because of the expected reward, because I, I was too junior to even understand that there could have been a reward out of that exercise. I was doing it for fun. I can't even lie to you. So the fact that it played out the way it played out, if I came here and told you that it was because I did smart goal setting and I saw that ah, it's specific, it's measurable, nah. So I will just end by telling you what you've probably heard in church plenty times, that C.S. Dow, a man diligent in his works, he will stand before what? Kings and not before mere men. All right. Any questions? If not, I can go. I cannot go. You have a question. Okay. Okay. Um, Hearing you speak and then talking about your journey. Okay, firstly, thank you very much for an amazing session. Um, how were you able to know? Because you, you said that at some point you did a lot of things, right? You were like, you did a lot before you knew what you wanted to do. So how did you know that is FinTech that is a thing for you? I know they will say you feel it, you just know it, but like, I want to know how you got to know that this is what you wanted to do. And then you also mentioned that um, there are times that you just want, it's important for you to just be general for a while. And I find myself in that space where I've done a lot when it comes to work. And, I'm, and then I'll feel like, oh, today is research that I like. And then after some time, the passion will die for research. Now it's advertising that is in my head. And I feel really good about it, right? not as much as I have felt for other things I have done. So is it that that's my niche? Is it that that's what I should focus on? Or should I just keep allowing God and myself just go with the flow, and then eventually I would not find that uh, Mr. Nifemi's moment too? <laughs> Interesting question. And I'll say that sometimes, right, God could even be pointing you in directions without you knowing it. And again, I'll give you further context on myself. My own plan, the one that I planned for myself, not the one God planned. By now, if I had not yet hit being a professor, maybe I'll be max two, three years shy of professor by now, using my current age as my, um, what's it called? It was very clear, finished my BSc in economics, immediately start my master's. My master's was going to be in international monetary economics. My PhD was also going to be further delving into international monetary economics. In fact, by the time I was finishing my BSc, I knew exactly who I wanted my supervisor for my master's to be. And any school that guy is in is where I was going to go and do my master's. Fast forward, end of NYSE. It's time for masters now. Asu strike happens. 
I'm like, this is the school I'm going to. I'll wait for ASU strike. By the time ASU strike finishes, the session had not concluded before the strike. So when they resumed, they were coming to do second semester of the previous session. By this time, I had finished NYSE, maybe six, seven months post NYSE. And I said, I am not working, that I'm going back to school. Like I was talking about focus, talking about uh, what are those things in here, commitment. I was committed to the goal. Fast forward month 10, or sorry, month 9, the school then comes and says a lot of people are applying for masters. They are going to write entrance exam. Again, that was the first time I knew that you can write entrance exam to come and do masters. Masters is the school I even finished from again. Master, they, so when they wrote exam, they pasted results. I think I was the second on the list. It pained me, but the person that came first, he just finished. So that was my consolation. That I mean, I've gone to NYC and come back, I've forgotten. That's why. But the point was, by the time the results came out, oh yeah, now admission time. Submit X, Y, Z, D, 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 D. They kept quiet. By month 10, randomly, one of my eggmans in the choir then, the church I attended, was just like, ah, there's an opening in First Bank. Oh, he worked in First Bank. He was not privy to this, my master's, this thing. You know how people will see you in church and you'll be like, ah, this young promising guy, he has finished serving since. He's just around, he's not doing anything. The next thing the guy says, oh, there's an opening you know, that he has even put my name on the list of those that passed the first interview, interview that I did not do. That the second interview is the following day that I should be coming. I was in the bad one. The interview was in Akure. I was in Akure that next morning. It's when I got to that second interview that they now gave me the paper of the first one. That I shall did it so that they can document it. Again, I don't know if I should call it favor or leg, but let's put it let's put it on one side. But again, what happened was I got there that same day, did the second interview, third interview, even did medical that day. We'll call you for your offer. Because when you do medical, it's as good as they are giving you the work. So by the time I was living in Badon. My brother-in-law, who also works in the bank, was like, ah, I heard you are going to do first bank interview. I thought you said you are not working. That that's why me, I did not push you. Oh, yeah, send your CV. I'm like, oh, yeah, now. Nah. I've gone to do an interview. I cannot tell him I'll not send. That's how I sent. He was working with Zenith. And then Zenith calls me. Those ones, I think I did like five interviews at different times. But guess what? The whole five interviews, remember the first one, I did everything in one day. This one I did five across maybe like two or three weeks. By the time I get an offer from them, I resume. Master's admission letter now comes. At that point, I was like, no, 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 no. This one that I started work, Masters, we we gonna wait, and that's how I left the master's dream. It was when I started working in the bank that I then got to learn about fintech products. So we were using products built like InterSwitch, eTransact, Remita, and that's where I got interested in those things. Like, ah, these things look really nice. You just click a button, it come and debit our system. Customers are happy. And I started to read more about it. Also, it was in that bank phase that I also then looked within the bank. So then, a lot of the banks had this emerging departments they were calling e-business. E-business is electronic business. That's when things like transfers had started to pick up. But what I looked at when I saw the people that were in those departments, it was like a rite of passage. Maybe you've done a few years as a teller. They've moved you to fund transfer officer. You've moved to another department. And naturally, they just move you to e-business. There were, at least, 
there was nobody I had seen that was in e-business because e-business is what they wanted to do. And it was at that point I told myself that, you know what, this fintech stuff, this business stuff is what I want to do. And as God will have it, the next job I would get was with System Specs Remita, one of those fintech platforms we were using in the bank. Between you, me, and God, till today, I don't know when I applied for that job. But the only reason why I know that I'm the one that applied is because when I checked my email at some point, I saw that I sent my CV to them. Who asked me to send it? How I knew about them? In fact, at the time I sent that CV, I didn't know that System Specs was owned by, uh, Remita was owned by System Specs. I just applied. In fact, to add the icing on the cake, the email for the interview for that job came in, it was 9 p.m. in the night. I was like, who sends an interview this thing at 9 p.m.? Which kind of serious company is this? You know, you work in bank, by 5 o'clock we have closed. So anybody that is sending mail at 9 p.m. seemed abnormal. But the fun fact was the date of the interview was the day I was starting my leave, leave I had planned months in advance. And for me, that was the evidence of divine orchestration because I had applied for the leave, they had approved, I had planned to go and relax and they said I should come and do interview, right? What I, or why I went this route to explain all of this is if I came here and told you that ah, I was strategic about it and whatnot, I would be lying to you. I also think that sometimes, you know, when we say some things and we say it as if it's a mantra about lying falling in pleasant places, sometimes it also helps with helping you to chart your course. So for you today, it is that, you know, what's the current one that is the earth cake now? Eh? advertising, it might be on your journey to becoming a full-blown marketing person, not just comes. Again, thinking about it, I used my organization as an example. The person who heads that department knows a lot of comps, knows a lot about branding, knows a lot about marketing. But if you go and find out what her core is, it was marketing that was the core. So sometimes it is also God putting you on multiple journeys. Right now, yes, I'm in financial technology, but in the last four years-ish, I've been focused on the lending side of financial technology. Before that, it was the payment side. And some of these things did not happen because it was planned. I remember taking up a job and they wanted me to do lending and I told them that if it's lending, I will not do this job. But guess what? Today, I am actually now doing the lending. So maybe God even wanted me to start on time, but I said no that time. The next job was now a lending job. The long and short is keep yourself open to the leadings of the Spirit and more often than not, the lines would fall in the pleasant places they were meant to fall. Can we truly appreciate this. Um, our sister Lemon wants to share a comment and then we'll round up now. We have another session, but you know, we can't take a lot of time has gone. Mm -hmm. So she would take the session. Okay. It's, so it's, so it's a quick comment. it's a quick comment on how do you know what you're supposed to do. I don't think you should put yourself under so much pressure to know number one, because okay, so for someone like me now, I studied finance bachelors and masters. So typically, you won't expect that I'll be in tech, but I'm in tech. But one thing that has been consistent from that time till now is that I create stuff, I build stuff, right? And then I help 
people and businesses make their life beautiful. That's what we do as fine artists. So it was a solid background for what I am doing currently. So like um, Nifemi said, you don't necessarily need to now say, I am going to be this for the rest of my life. It's a journey. You want to allow yourself to evolve. The only thing is, during that process, don't be stagnant, waiting for what you don't even know about. Grow with the journey. So if you are excited about advertising, get on it and explore every aspect of it till you find anything else or till you are now in that space where you say, like, I don't think I want anything other than business analysis or business management or branding. Because I've been doing it both directly and indirectly. I've helped people, you know, brand for free. I've actively looked for people to brand and I just enjoy it. Fortunately, I am I'm in a business that does that officially. So now what I enjoy, I'm making money from it. So at the end of the day, you'll now see that whatever you finally end up doing, all of these things that you've learned in your full career journey now becomes your specialization. And then you are now someone who probably is a comms person, but understands marketing, understands advertising, understands this. So when you now hire people or you are now leading people and they are doing it wrongly, you can put them in the right path. And then mentorship makes the journey shorter. So you want to find someone that is already in that line and then let them guide you as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. She hit the nail on the head. Um, 